So, after talking all day about uh, imaging and diagnosis, uh, I want to go into therapy. And uh, we are radiologists, but we do have some small niches where we do a little bit of therapy. And uh, this is uh, the MR guided focus ultrasound surgery uh, for uterine fibroids and adenomyosis, which is com in good for our talk today. So I'll go over what focus ultrasound is, and then we will go over uterine fibroids, which is the main application, and a little bit about adenomyosis, and I'll try to be brief and quick. So MR-guided focus ultrasound is a technology that combines two uh, technologies. One of them is focus ultrasound, and the ultrasound here is not used for imaging, but it is used for heating and ablating tissue. And MRI, which is used for visualizing and controlling the treatment, assessing results, and all over keeping us in check. So how does it work? Uh, focus ultrasound is actually like what you did when you were children, uh, taking a magnifying glass and trying to focus the sun uh, and lighting a bonfire. And you take a transducer with many elements, here a transducer of, for instance, 225, 225 elements, and you focus them into a single spot. And as you can see in the gel, here you can see the coagulation in a tiny spot. And what we get is a very sharp penumbra, and you can see that number one, which is in exactly the spot that we are heating, the temperature rise is up to 82. At the edge, I'm sorry, at the edge, which is number two, you can see the corresponding heating up to 52. And then even seven millimeters away, it only goes up to 39. So you get a really nice, we call these sonications, and the heating is only where you want it to be with no damage to surrounding tissue. What does the MR give us? Well, it gives us many things. First of all, it gives us 3D imaging, uh, and it gives us, of course, diagnosis in the beginning, but uh, for precise tumor targeting. And then we can see both the anatomy and the beam path and guide the treatment in order to be at the exact same spot we want to be. We can monitor thermometry and see if we have uh, too much heating or the heating is not enough. We can change many parameters to get uh, to the temperature that we want to heat. We have accumulated thermal dose that is calculated by the system. And at the end, when you inject gadolinium, you can see the result and assess uh, the success of the treatment. So what are the benefits of focus ultrasound or MR-guided focus ultrasound? First of all, it's a non-invasive procedure. There is no hospitalization. We give limited conscious sedation. It's MRI and ultrasound, so there's no radiation. The patient goes back to her normal activities the next day. There is a very low uh, rate of complications, uh, again, due to the MR guidance and the closed loop thermal feedback. And overall, there is a reduction in cost. So this is the system. It's an Israeli invention by a company named Insitec, who is based in Haifa. And it is a system that uh, goes on the 1.5T of GE, not other systems. And they have many applications, and all you do is change the cradle, and then you can have uh, different systems. And these are the different applications that are done today. Uh, these are the ones that we mostly do uh, in Sheba. We do the uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. We have a new program for bone metastasis that's become commercial and not uh, research. And we've done a few functional brain disorders. Uh, these are things that are done in Europe, and these are still in research. So this is how the treatment is done. This is an illustration. The patient lies prone on the bed. The transducer is inside the MR bed. And you can see that you move the transducer and you heat single spots in the fibroid until you cover uh, the area that you want. This is without breaking the skin. All is done externally and non-invasively. So what are uterine fibroids? As you all know, these are benign tumors of the myometrium. They can be numerous, they can vary in size and type. And you already were questioned about the uh, name of the fibroid according to the location. So you can see it here. It affects about 70% of women over the age of 30, and about 25% of those will suffer. And the symptoms that they suffer from are mostly excessive bleeding, 
pressure symptoms in the pelvis, either on the bladder, the rectum, the nerves, and they can interfere with fertility and with pregnancy. And there are a lot of treatments uh, out there going from doing nothing to hysterectomy, which of course is the ultimate treatment, but then uh, you cannot have babies, and many of these women would like to have babies. And MR-guided focus ultrasound is so non-invasive that it's somewhere between drug therapy and uterine artery embolization. This is a busy slide just to show you that uh, women, many women, really don't want to have hysterectomies, even though the gynecologist really wants to do them. And this is a survey that was done in the United States on a thousand women, and as you can see that 80% of them would like to have treatments that do not include <coughs> or involve invasive surgery. Half of them would like to preserve their uterus, and of course, almost half of the women under the age of 40 still wish to preserve fertility in Israel. I'm sure it's much more than that. Also, when you look at women post-hysterectomy, this is a paper on 314 women that were questioned three years post-hysterectomy. Again, 50% of these women regretted the loss of fertility, and a third of them had issues uh, with their femininity. So uh, there is room for many options that are non-invasive uh, treatments and uterine preserving treatments. So MR-guided focus ultrasound for uterine uh, fibroids was proven to be effective and safe with success rates ranging from 75 to 85. And just take my word for it, for it for many articles, we won't go over all of these. It has also been shown that the larger you treat, the greater the volume reduction and the symptom relief. And if you treat over 60% of the fibroid, then you, your results actually uh, correspond to all the other non, um, non uh, the myomectomy and the UAE, all the preserving uh, surgeries that you can do. But success depends on many things. And first and foremost, it depends on patient selection. And this is most of what we will talk about today because this is where we come uh, into play. It also depends on the physician's skill. Again, another place where we come into play because this is a treatment that is done by radiologists and technical improvements, and there have been many of those over the years. So how do we select patients? Uh, patients are selected based on their medical history and the screening MR images. So the first criteria is an existence of a fibroid or fibroids that are relevant to the patient's symptoms. And location and size of fibroids have clinical significance. Submucosal fibroids are a common cause of uterine bleeding. If you have subserosal fibroids or you have large or multiple fibroids, these can cause pressure symptoms. And the caveat is, if symptoms do not correlate to size and location of fibroids, then MR-guided focus ultrasound may not be the appropriate treatment to choose. And our ideal patient has symptomatic uterine fibroids, between one to five fibroids, with a total fibroid volume of less than 500 cc's, and that's about a 10 centimeter fibroid. They can fit into the MR, they have no contraindications. There is nothing to block the ultrasound beam from reaching the fibroid, no scar tissue, bowel adhesion, etc. I'll show you in a minute. And they have no other uterine or pelvic diseases. We, of course, do not uh, take pregnant patients. Postmenopausal patients are debatable. Patients who have contraindications to MR and all this large list of things that all of you uh, are very well aware of. So what do we look for in MR? We look for the T2 characteristics or the texture of the fibroid. We look for viability, since if you have a fibroid that's already dead, then there's no reason to treat it. Location, size, number, accessibility to the system, and of course, other uh, issues in the pelvis. So this is what a classic uterine or textbook fibroid looks like. Okay, this is sagittal and axial images. This is on uh, a prone position because this is how we treat. So you can see the uterus and the dark hypointense fibroid inside. And the classic fibroid uh, is low signal intensity on T2 weighted images. And the proportion between different things in the fibroid, the cell fascicles, the extracellular matrix, and the different types of the generations that a fibroid can undergo, all of these affect the T2 signal. Some of them will lower the signal and some of them will uh, higher the, make the signal higher. 
And T1 can aid us in the uh, event of red degeneration, which is hemorrhage, and then you can see high signal intensity on T1 weighted images. And these are uh, fibroids in real life. They go from very dark to very bright, and they can have a mixture of every color in between. And it has been shown in a few papers that the white or the hyper-intense fibroids on T2 weighted images are least responsive with smaller treatment proportions and a smaller uh, shrinkage ratio compared to the dark fibroids, so we do prefer these. Viability, as I said, if you have a fibroid that's not enhancing, then there's no point in treating it. There will be no additional benefit. Location is a factor. This is just a case of one thing that we would not treat, and that's a pedunculated fibroid. We do not want this to detach and go floating about in the abdomen. If we have too many fibroids, as I said, or fiber that's too large, we don't treat these. It's very difficult, it takes a lot of time, and there are many technical issues that prevent us from treating the whole fibroid, so we do not do these fibroids. It is an option to consider GnRH agonist uh, prior to treatment to make the fibroids smaller, and we do give three months of uh, injections prior to treatment. You make the fibroids smaller, it's less vascular, and it's much easier to treat, and then whatever you treat doesn't grow back. So that's an option to consider. Uh, I'd like you just to think again, this is a volume and not size. So uh, going down or up from uh, three to four or uh, from four to five, it's uh, twofold in, in volume and it's not just one centimeter. And that goes also for reduction in size. If you tell a patient that uh, she had a five centimeter fibroid and now it's a four centimeter fibroid, it actually shrank 50%. So it's not too bad. Accessibility is an issue. Uh, we don't go through bowel loops uh, so as not to perforate them. So, of course, in a case like this, uh, we do not have access to the bowel. Here we have limited access and then it doesn't make much sense to treat. And here, of course, we have nice access. The transducer, this is the transducer, is inside the bed. The patient is prone and you need to have clear access to the fibroid. We do have so some maneuvers to move this, as you can see here. We have bowel in front of the fibroid, but we can do some maneuvers using different gel pads. Uh, here we filled the rectum with the gel, ultrasound gel. We filled the bladder with uh, water and then we uh, took it out on the bed. And in the end, we got a nice uh, position for the fibroid. And these are the post-treatment images. And you can see um, post uh, gadolinium images, uh, the fibroid is completely dead. Again, if it's too deep, if there is excessive scarring, this will prevent the ultrasound beam from reaching the fibroid and heating it uh, sufficiently. Other disorders, these are patients that came uh, with a diagnosis of a fibroid for treatment and had other things. This is a patient that had a sarcoma. This crazy thing was a uterine sarcoma. Unfortunately, even though we said it was a sarcoma, she was uh, operated in another hospital and they disseminated this thing in her abdomen and she died two years later. It was very tragic. And this is a case of adenomyosis, which we will see soon. And again, these are patients that came with a diagnosis from ultrasound of a uterine fibroid for treatment. This patient had germ cell tumor. This patient had a fibroid but had, again, a dermoid cyst. And this was a tubo ovarian abscess, of a chronic tubo ovarian abscess, and she went with the title of uterine fibroid for many years. So we said success depends on selection, on physician skill, and on the technical improvements. If we have all of these, then we have larger treatment volumes. And if we have that, we get better clinical results and a low complication rate. And if you see here, over the years, how the NPV ratio or the amount that we treat grew from 22%. This was in the beginning when we were limited to only 30% by the FDA, and then it went up to nearly 90 over the years. So there is hope for this. And these are a few examples from our practice, and you can see each sagittal uh, images on both T2 and uh, post-contrast uh, uh, after treatment, and you can see all of these, the nice uh, treatment volumes inside these fibroids. What about durability of symptoms? Uh, if you treat over 60%, as I said, then you are comparable to uterine artery embolization and myomectomy. And of course, this is a much less uh, dangerous and with less side effects than all the other options. 
This is a case, three year follow up, went down from 280 cc's to 23 cc's with alleviation of symptoms. As you can see here, complication rate is very low and the severe adverse events are very rare. These were all from one site in America. Um, we didn't have, uh, luckily for us, any of these uh, complications uh, yet. <laughs> what about pregnancies? Uh, they, there can be pregnancies after focus ultrasound and this is even a, a very attractive option to treat patients who wish uh, fertility. And you can see here that if you compare uh, cesarean deliveries and preterm deliveries, uh, to the general population, patients who have fibroids but have done nothing, uterine artery embolization and laparoscopic myomectomy, focus ultrasound is the same as uterine fibroids and much better than any other treatment option. And the number of preterm deliveries is even smaller, but this is maybe because we didn't have so many patients who got pregnant. So that's it for, for, for uterine fibroids, and I'd like to go quickly through the adenomyosis. We talked about endometriosis, so this is actually complementing the whole thing. So uh, adenomyosis is benign invasion of the endometrium into the myometrium, and this also results in reactive hypertrophy of the smooth muscle cell. It appears in about 20 to 30 percent of women. It is highest uh, in prevalence in a women of Asian origin, and there is a peak prevalence in the first, fifth decade of life. The etiology and pathophysiology are not very well understood and we did talk about it before so I won't talk about it again. It's often associated with other hormone dependent pelvic conditions such as fibroids or deep pelvic endometriosis. We saw that also. Symptoms, uh, a third of the patients can be asymptomatic but symptoms are usually uh, uterine bleeding, either painful and or excessive menstruation, pelvic pain and problems with fertility. The uterus is enlarged and there are two forms, the diffuse form and the focal form. And the diagnosis on MRI are usually, you see a uterus which is globular, it's, the contour is regular, there is asymmetrical thickening, and the signs that you look for are the junction zone. If it's more than 12 uh, millimeters, then it's adenomyosis. You can look at the ratio between the junction zone and the total myometrium. And if you have foci of bleeding or high signal intensity, on T2, which is not bleeding, it's the endometrial uh, secretions, and if you have them on high T1 with the bleeding, then this is very easy to make the diagnosis. So adenomyosis is a twofold problem. It's a problem to diagnose it, and it's a problem how to treat it. And it's a problem to diagnose it since it, it coexists and has symptoms of many other things, especially uterine fibroids. And on ultrasound, which is the most widely available imaging for women, it's uh, very often uh, underestimated and not, not well seen. And that is because uh, it's operator dependent, but also because the technique has low sensitivity. And MRI, which is the modality of choice, is not used routinely, but it is the best way to see uh, adenomyosis. Treatment again, hysterectomy is the definitive treatment, but then if you have hysterectomy, then there's no fertility, and these women are mostly young and they want to have babies. And there's no consensus as to the best treating option uh, for preservation of the uterus. There are some forms of uh, surgery, specific surgeries. Mostly patients get hormonal treatment, either pills or an IUD. But then again, if you get these treatments, you can't have a baby. So uh, in this setting, focus ultrasound is a very appealing approach because it's not invasive, and yet it allows the patient uh, to uh, have her uterus and have the children. So again, MRI can diagnose uh, the adenomyosis preoperatively. The uh, ultrasound can heat and ablate the tissue. There's a very uh, high safety profile, and it's a nice alternative for conservative treatment. And this was the first patient we ever treated uh, with focal adenomyosis, as you can see here on the posterior wall. And she was actually treated in a study that was done for fibroids, but we kind of put her in there. And uh, two months uh, post-treatment, uh, this patient conceived and had a normal pregnancy and vaginal delivery. And then we didn't hear for her, from her for many years. And two years ago, while I was in a conference about focus ultrasound, I got an email from her. She lives in France and uh, has been there for about 14 years. And she said she was coming to Israel and she wanted to come and say thank you. And she brought me this from her daughter. Mm -hmm. 
who made this beautiful poster, and she said it was okay for me to show. And that was a very heartwarming uh, moment for a radiologist to have somebody <laughs> come and give them this. Uh, the literature is uh, scarce and there are not many patients, especially not in the MR-guided focus ultrasound. Some of them are even just case reports and there are very few uh, patients, patient cohorts in these studies. But you can see that uh, if you look at the uh, symptom severity score, then the studies that were done had a, a lowered <coughs> symptom severity score after treatment of, of adenomyosis. And this is the, larger, the longest follow-up I could find. Uh, that was presented in 2011. They had uh, 39 patients, and 60% of them, after two years, still did not need any further treatment for their adenomyosis. And they had uh, a very nice improvement in their symptom severity score from 51 down to 24. This is one of our patients uh, with a 12 months follow up. You can see here she also had a small fibroid, and this is the adenomyosis and the bulge into the uterine cavity. And this is post-treatment, six months and 12 months post-treatment. And you can see that this bulge here also straightened after the treatment. So to summarize what we just said, uh, focus ultrasound or MR-guided focus ultrasound for uterine fibroids is safe and effective with success rates ranging from 75 to 85%. Patient selection is crucial for success. The larger you treat, the better the long-term results. And of course, treatments get better as technology improves and as the operator becomes more experienced. And MR-guided focus ultrasound is a good option for treating adenomyosis. And thank you with this.